So I think it's uh, time we shall start. Um, I'd like to begin firstly by welcoming everyone to the Chow Chak Wing Museum, both uh, those of you, uh, those of you joining us in the auditorium, and also uh, a number of people, including students who are joining us via Zoom as well. Uh, we are meeting on the grounds of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the University of Sydney and the Chow Chak Wing Museum wishes to pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land, the unceded land in which we are meeting today, and to pay our respect to the knowledge holders and custodians of that long tradition. My name's uh, Craig Barker. I'm the head of public engagement for the Chow Chak Wing Museum, and it is a great privilege uh, to have you join us today for International Museums Day. Happy International Museums Day, everyone. The 18th of May was designated by ICOM uh, more than four decades ago as uh, International Day, a day to uh, focus uh, uh, attention on issues concerning museums and museum collections um, and to celebrate and commemorate uh, the achievements of museums. Uh, this is the second year the Chow Chak Wing Museum has marked International Museums Day with a panel, so I think we're one off from becoming a tradition, um, but I'm very, very excited both by this year's theme, but also by this year's panellists as well. So uh, ICOM has designated 2020 as uh, uh, the year in which we mark the power of museums. And so the whole aim of this discussion is for us to actually explore some of the concepts around what are the roles of museums and what are the powers of museums? What have we done well and what have we done badly? Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves one at a time in a moment, but what's very exciting is that each of our panelists have all graduated from the University of Sydney's Museum and Heritage Study Program or Museum Studies as it was in the past as well, um, and they each represent uh, different uh, generations and different eras of the program as well. We're not going to talk about age at the moment, but uh, um, what is, is fascinating is that uh, all four of them are fascinating people in their own right, but collectively representing a whole range of different institutions here in Sydney and a whole lot of different perspectives. And so really looking forward to discussing the power of museums with you all. Would anyone like to volunteer to go first or so I point? Melanie, you're mind on. just test my microphone. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Melanie Pitkin. I'm the relatively recently appointed Senior Curator of Antiquities here at the Chow Chak Wing Museum. Um, I'm an Egyptologist by academic training. I was at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge before coming here for four years as a postdoctoral research associate in Egyptian antiquities. And before that, I worked at the Powerhouse Museum for quite a long time, um, mostly in curatorial roles. Um, and I've done a lot of work in Egypt as well, both in terms of field work and supporting museums over there, in particular the Egyptian Museum in Tahri Square. So I'm looking forward to today's panel. Hi everyone, my name's Kim Tao and I'm the curator at Sydney Living Museums. Um, so I work across the City Museums portfolio, um, but particularly with Hyde Park Barracks and the Mint. Um, my background is in museums of social history, um, community engagement, immigration, I worked at the Maritime Museum for about 15 years, um, local government as well, so. Hi, I'm Miriama and I'm a collections and, um, sorry, it's a long title. I'm an exhibition and collection enhancement project officer at the Australian Museum in the Pacifica team. And I finished my master's at the end of last year and I have Fijian heritage on my dad's side. And so I'm really interested in working with Pacific collections and engaging meaningfully with our communities. Hi everyone, I'm Tuan Nguyen. Um, I'm currently at the Powerhouse Museum as uh, an assistant curator, uh, working on a Carlos Zampati exhibition. Uh, is this? It's, okay. it's fine. Um, and, but most of my experience has been in collections, um, first at the National Archives and uh, later at the Powerhouse Museum. Um, previous to that, I along with doing a Master of Museum Studies, I um, did a PhD uh, on queer inclusion in Australian museums. And that, yeah, I get to bring that to my role somewhat. So excellent, a wide range of diverse interests, backgrounds and experiences. I would like to begin by asking each of the four of you to um, you know, define the power of museums from your perspective. 
What is the power of a museum? It's one of my asked you to go first. Yep. Mic. My mic's on. I have the printout right here. So, <laughs> um, so if we go by, let's start with ICOM's definition of the power of a museum. Um, so there are incomparable places of discovery. They teach us about the past in order to build a better future. They help us to achieve, achieve sustainability by disseminating scientific information. They're innovative, innovative playgrounds. They thread a social fabric that is essential in community building and they shape an informed and engaged civil society. Um, I think this is what museums can be at their best. But if we have a look at the landscape of museum practice, it's always a pastiche of best practice and not so best practice. Um, so I think when we talk about the power of museums in these really undiluted terms, we also need to step back and um, you know look at who's actually coming to museums. Um, museums and galleries in New South Wales have produced a number of audience surveys over the years, first in 2011, 2015, called Guess Who's Coming to the Museum? And it reiterates what we've known for many decades uh, about museum audiences. We're privileged, highly educated, tend to be like older, predominantly women, um, centered in metropolitan centers. Um, and so, yeah, when we talk about the power of museums, we have to sort of bear that in mind that we're, you know, speaking to um, a fairly closed audience. Yeah, I might leave it there. Yeah, um, so my work at the moment is really based in community engagement um, and we're really focused on bring it in our communities into the museum that typically have it. And I've had the privilege to be able to bring our community um, members and leaders to be able to uh, visit and tour our collections. And it has been a really emotional experience for a lot of people. It brings up difficult feelings, um, feelings of sadness a lot of the time, but it also has been an opportunity for healing for a lot of people. We believe our ancestors um, uh, along with our objects in our collections. Um, and so I do think that there is a power of museums to be able to open the doors more fully and allow communities um, to build and foster their own spaces and be able to reconnect, especially diaspora communities in Sydney and Australia. Yeah. Thank you. Kim? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Greg. I, I think the power of museums for me is, is that potential to reunite people with their heritage and material culture. Um, and one of the things that I, I suppose the highlight of my career um, years ago doing an exhibition about British child migrants um, and that toured around Australia and the UK um, but it was when we were I was leading a tour of the exhibition in Albury and I remember sort of all this um, commotion and sort of yelling and screaming happening from the back of the tour and I was thinking gosh people in Albury are so rude you know and, <laughs> but what had happened was these two sisters had discovered um, a photograph of themselves as children in the exhibition so on the very day they arrived in Fremantle and they had never seen this photo before and it captured them um, with their three brothers and so it was just this incredible moment of of discovery of serendipity of um, just coming together they were actually visiting Albury from uh, from Perth um, and so for me it was the power of museums to I suppose to, to, to collect this culture, to, to showcase it, to make it accessible and to reunite people with, with that history, heritage, sort of discover their identities. Um, I'm not going to try and conflate uh, the meaning of the power. Uh, just... Can you all hear me okay on Zoom? Okay. Hi everyone, sorry about that. Um, I'm not going to try and conflate, conflate the, the power of the museum into a single sentence. I think museums have many powers. Um, I guess in terms of the collection itself, objects, seeing them in the flesh, really, it's very powerful and transformative in itself. Coming from the perspective of an antiquities curator and seeing people come face to face with an object from thousands of years ago, it makes you realize that sense of awe and wonder and how we're actually small specks in the universe and there's something a lot bigger than us out there. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, 
museums are a place of trust and I think we have to be ethically responsible with that but it also means we're a platform where we can engage in you know controversial ideas and be a catalyst or a vehicle for impacting positive change and getting people to think differently. Museums also reach a lot of people and a lot of diverse audiences and I was kind of interested in um, Tuan's comment about it being closed. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. Um, but we do have the platform of the physical space with visitors and also online. Um, and also that's that whole capability of lifelong learning that comes with museums. And it's very empowering for visitors because they can do that on their own terms. They can come to the museum when it suits them, they can choose their own path. It's a bit like those choose your own adventure storybooks. Um, but I think that's very uh, empowering in itself for the museum visitor. Thank you. One thing um, when we were thinking about this panel that kept on popping up in my mind, and it's interesting, I think all four of you have touched upon it in some degree with your answers as well, but um, the transformative aspect of museums that we often hear of both individual and, and group and, and, and broader community experiences of being in a museum, yeah, having some degree of feeling of change, even if it's only temporary. Um, can all four of you talk about an experience either as a museum visitor yourself or from your career as a museum professional where you've felt that power of the transformative aspect of museums as well? Uh, Melanie, I might get you to go first. Um, so I'm going to go back a decade. Um, when I was working at the Powerhouse Museum, I worked on an exhibition called Faith, Fashion, Fusion, Muslim Women's Style in Australia. Um, and this exhibition looked at the emerging modest fashion market through a group of Muslim retailers in Sydney. Um, but because of the stereotypes around, you know, judging how Muslim women dress, we also balance that by having a group of women tell their own stories about what it's like to be Muslim in Australia. That was really transformative both in terms of my own curatorial practice. Um, in terms of community engagement, it was very much a way of life for us. So my colleague, Glenna Stones and myself spent so much time just building up trust with the community so they could feel like they could tell their stories to us. Um, and I think one critical thing about doing community engagement work is that you need to be able to sustain it for the long term. And for communities to feel empowered, it needs to be long beyond that project. Um, it was also a platform for Muslim women to feel like they had a voice, um, to feel like they had a space in the museum to be heard and to challenge preconceptions about what it is to be Muslim and, and what it means to dress modestly. Um, you know, people think it means that you are oppressed um, for the general sort of stereotype there, but it's a big feminist decision as well to decide to cover up. Um, so that story very much came out and helped to get people to think differently about Muslim women. Um, I won't hold the floor too much. <laughs> Um, so my transformative experience was last year developing an exhibition called A Mile in My Shoes. Um, that was for Sydney Festival and it was a collaboration between the Maritime Museum and the Empathy Museum in the UK. Um, so you might have seen it, it was, it was a giant shoe box outside in Darling Harbour and the idea was that you come in, you put on a pair of shoes that belong to a refugee or a migrant, um, you walked a mile in their shoes while listening to their migration story. Um, and so developing this exhibition sort of in the context of COVID and so we're putting on someone else's shoes and, and sharing headphones and things was not a very good idea. Um, so it was an extremely challenging project to develop. Um, but the transformative mm -hmm. moment came when, um, so at the end of the exhibition, we have visitor comments and we ask people, what's it like to walk a mile in someone else's shoes? And one comment that stood out to me was um, somebody saying, we are all the same, albeit different shoe sizes. Mm -hmm. And that was, incredibly transformative in the sense that they got it and sort of through all the challenges that the team had gone through in bringing this exhibition together in the context of the pandemic and everything going on in the world. Um, I guess that message of, of common humanity and the fact that um, there is more that binds us and we are more similar than, than we are different. Um, and I think that's the transformative power of um, those empathetic museum experiences. Um, so bringing uh, members from our community and our traditional knowledge holders into the collection provided a transformative experience for me because a lot of people express their sadness to see um, objects that they don't get to see back home in the islands, but they also felt grateful and a happiness to see that they were being preserved and cared for. And it made me feel a greater responsibility in my museum role and in my work um, to make sure that I do right by all of the objects and cultural belongings in the collection and to make sure that we have the correct protocols for handling, storage and display. Um, yeah. 
Um, thank you for sure sharing. That's amazing. Um, I guess I, well, first thing, I kind of focus on the word um, transformative. Um, that if the notion is that you walk out of a museum and gallery as a completely different person, then I don't think I've actually had a transformative experience. As you said, it could be temporary. Um, that being said, I've had a, a, a lot of amazing museum experiences that, you know, give me an aha moment or um, bring me to the verge of tears. Um, and the experience that sort of pops to mind when I think of a transformative experience um, after completing my PhD in 2017, I went on a, um, a couple of months for a holiday and um, I did a pilgrimage to Concord, Massachusetts because I wanted to see Walden Pond. I wanted to see where Henry David Thoreau lived. Um, I wanted to sort of inhabit his world. And um, it wasn't just the Concord Museum. It wasn't just um, the, um, the pond and the visitor center. Um, it, it was the whole kind of cultural landscape that worked together. Um, and it sort of um, reinforced uh, my own sort of beliefs in, in um, ecology and a connectedness with nature and living deliberately. But even if I look at that experience, I, it, or it just reinforced what I had inside. So it wasn't transformative. Um, it was, you could say it was a little transformation, um, temporary. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> Sounds very affirmative, probably. Yes. <laughs> now, look, thank you, everyone, for answers. That's, that's uh, you know, truly quite remarkable. And I'm hoping that everyone else in the audience has had, you know, at least a moment of being in a museum going, wow. Um, but uh, uh, moving along, it's, I think we've already established everyone on the panel is only 21 years of age, but we've uh, um, all at different, uh, different points in your careers as museum professionals. One thing I wanted to ask is how, what assumptions of museums or, or, or how you think about museums, what do you feel has changed over the, the time that you've actually been engaged in a career working within a museum? How do you think differently about museums, I guess, is ultimately what I'm after, from, from when you were a student as to, to, to where you are now. And Twan, I might get you to go first, if you don't mind. Um, so, um, I think something that I'm living through at the moment is how difficult it is to, um, to affect change in especially a larger organization. And so, um, I guess I've always known that, you know, putting principles into practice, principles of diversity and inclusion um, was going to be difficult, but the embodied experience of trying to bring that about is um, something that is new to me and that I'm discovering every day. Um, so that's the assumption. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mean that, you know, you can't affect some small change. Um, currently I'm working on the labels for um, an exhibition I'm working on, on Carla Zampatti. She was a fashion designer uh, for over five decades. Um, and you could uh, rightly think that a lot of her market was, you know, rich white women, but the equally a part of the story are women who you know, couldn't afford the garment, um, but that purchased it on lay-by. Um, these are the, the stories which are really powerful to me and that I kind of seek to amplify all the time. 
Yeah, that's really relatable, um, speaking about trying to affect change within these old institutions, and we come up against that a lot. Um, but I think some an assumption that I made was that I've obviously always loved museums and enjoyed visiting them, and that's why I decided to do a master's and try to work in museums. Um, but it was new to me to learn that a lot of people don't feel welcome, that other people in my community um, don't feel welcome and see them as intimidating places um, that are holding their cultural belongings and not doing right by them. Um, so that has been something that I've confronted and to learn about and see those different perspectives and try to do better. Kim. Thanks. Um, for me, it's about, I guess, that idea that museums are about the past when they're actually as much about the present as the future um, and those intergenerational connections and, and as much about living history as well. And um, one thing when I was thinking about this was um, years ago doing an exhibition called Remembering Scalbrin. And it was based on an archive of photographs um, documenting the fire and rescue on a post-war migrant ship. And, um, and I remember getting this letter from, from the Ferugia family and they said this was the most indescribable discovery for, for their family um, to see this archive. And it was something because their father had come out as a young man um, and, and he'd passed away. And they were talking about the stories that he told them as, as they were growing up. Um, but they could never visualise the experience and his experience until they discovered this archive and exhibition at the Maritime Museum. And so it was sort of that sense that, um, I mean, it brought home kind of the, the enduring legacy of these journeys that people make um, and that enduring legacy through the generations and how it continues to impact um, kind of down the line. So I suppose for me, it's, it's that idea, you know, that, that idea of museums as much being about living history and connecting to present and future generations as well. Yeah. Um, I guess across institutions globally, we tend to think that museums are for everyone. And in theory, they are for everyone, but the reality is not everyone thinks a museum is for them. So I've done a lot of work with culturally underprivileged communities in England and also in Egypt. And it really opened my eyes up to the fact there are so many invisible barriers still to take, you know, to bring people into the museum. Um, just while working at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, which is the University of Cambridge's main museum, it has a very grand and imposing facade. And it was when looking at some visitor results from an exhibition that we had where the majority of visitors were from the local area, they were degree educated, most of them postgraduate degree educated, but where are the rest of even the Cambridgeshire audiences? So we were doing a lot of work trying to go out into those communities to make them aware of the museum and to let them know that it's for them as well. And also if you haven't got a degree, and I, I think it's a problem here as well for any university museum, you just don't think that you belong on campus and you can go and visit the museum. And just very quickly in Egypt, um, doing work with the Egyptian Museum in Tahrir Square, um, there, in, well, I, there's no stats there, but informally they'll say to me that the majority of their visitors are tourists. And the population in Cairo is like 25 million. It's the whole of Australia in Cairo. So going out to see communities there to talk to them about the museum, they just think it's for foreigners only and not for locals. So there's a lot of work that has to be done still in, in dispelling that because it really, you know, museums are for everyone, but it's not clear to everyone. Thank you, Melanie. That, your comments actually segue very nicely into the next question I was going to ask because all four of you have been involved and you, you've all um, spoken about it so far on the panel as well, but all four of you have worked with uh, community engagement. Can I ask your opinions, and you can also bring in your own experiences as well, but um, uh, uh, can I ask you all to describe what museums can do better to engage with communities in order to empower them? We've already alluded to a few of these points and some of the answers as well, but I'm just wondering from your opinion, are there particular things that we as a sector can do better? Okay, so I guess the problem is, and I, I've been in different institutions now. So when I worked at the powerhouse, the biggest problem there was curators jump from project to project. So you'd spend all this time building up relationships with the community, and then suddenly you're moved on to something else. And the only way you can sustain those relationships really is in your own personal time, but institutions need to be responsible for that, not just the individual curators. So that for me is a really big issue. I think now that I've come to the Chow Chat Bing Museum and I'm just looking after antiquities, I can do a lot more to make sure that, that there's continuity and I can maintain those relationships. Mm. Um, I've already started working very closely with the Egyptian community. 
um, and it takes a long time and it's not something that you just do quickly. Um, it, it has to come from a genuine place and I really do care about making sure Egyptians feel a sense of belonging when they come to the museum and feel connected to their heritage. So that for me is an ongoing mission now is to work closely with them, but I think it needs to go across all organisations and the to at top level they need to understand that as well because staff move on. And often those relationships go with the staff. But if, if leadership recognise that, then there's a better way to, to sustain it for perpetuity. Yeah, sustainability, I <laughs> would echo those comments. And, and I think um, sort of trust and, and actually not being tokenistic about those relationships as well. And for me, working in particularly with immigration history, um, there's this sort of tick the box and so we've done the Chinese this year we've done the Greeks we've done the Italians sort of what's next and so I think that that mentality has to change as well that's sort of very um moving on to different projects but um but community engagement is a very interesting thing at, in my current role um so working at Sydney Living Museums and and I think most of you know that um we are in a merger with New South Wales State Archives and we are re-emerging as Museums of History New South Wales um, so there's really exciting opportunities at the moment to engage um, and to tell much broader stories. And so if you're familiar with SLM and the Historic Houses Trust, um, a lot of our storytelling is very much uh, property and family based um, on a very sort of a, a small a micro level. And so the big challenge for the institution at the moment is, is how do we tell those bigger picture stories and, and tell the story of New South Wales? Um, and so we're sort of embarking at the moment on community engagement um, in terms of First Nation communities, culturally diverse, um, regional and re remote communities, and sort of how do we empower them to tell their stories? Um, one thing I'm working on at the moment is, is a refugee curator residency program for SLM. And so we're going to bring in sort of um, refugee voices and interpretations um, into the perspectives of, of our museums and properties. Um, and uh, one thing I was thinking of sort of last week with if you saw Black Douglas winning um, the Archibald Prize. And so he's done some commissions for SLM. Um, and what he was doing was sort of looking at the records in state archives and, and at a SLM and reinterpreting them through his own perspective. Um, so I guess um, there's that work to be done around sort of, um, I guess, un empowering people and communities to, to unlock those personal stories in the collection and, and to interpret them in their own ways. Thank you, Mary. Um, so in my current role, we're currently developing the new Pacifica Gallery at the Australian Museum, and that's involving a lot of community engagement. Um, and we have a curatorial collective, which has eight members on it that will be contributing to the development. Um, and during that process, we've been speaking with community and getting their feedback on previous engagement with museums that they've had. And something that continues to come up is the feeling that they're brought in at the beginning and then brought back at the end during the opening. And there's a whole process that they miss out on. Um, um, particularly it can be during the installation and the build and so things are lost in translation and by the time it gets to display some things are culturally inappropriate or just culturally strange um, but throughout the process as well we're trying to bring in our indigenous ways of doing things so for our development of the Pacifica Gallery that involves the Pacifica concept of Talanoa which is transparent um, and inclusive uh, discussion to come to a collective good um, and so bringing that word into it and bringing that out to community helps them to know exactly what we're trying to do um, and gather um, so yeah <laughs> I think that um, making sure that um, communities are involved throughout the entire process is really really important. Um, I guess I've been thinking about this for ever since I was born. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, just growing up in Australia as a Vietnamese Australian person and then hailing from different communities as well um, um, as a gay, queer, identified man as well, I've definitely um, feel like I've been on the other side of, you know, museum collaboration. Um, and so it makes me... Um, that, that kind of colors my understanding of, of how you can engage with communities. Um, so, yeah, thinking about it for a while, including in my studies, and it often comes back to a simple aphorism, like the simple principle 
um, that contains the core truth. And one of them, I could spout many, many, but um, nothing about us without us is one of those things. So um, one of the ways in which this is currently working in my current workplace, um, I'm involved in the development of an exhibition that will coincide with Mardi Gras slash World Pride for next year. And uh, the, the museum has done, the powerhouse has done amazing things in this space, um, you know, at various points in the 1990s and yeah. Um, and we're, we're hoping to sort of update that legacy. Um, I'm part of a committee, um, half of us are queer identified, the other half are queer allies. And I think it's very important to have it seems like a really obvious thing, but queer representation on a committee, which is, you know, um, making an exhibition about queer communities. Um, I think it's a, yeah, it's an important discussion to have, to have those people, not just, you know, on the other side of the museum, but also inside as well. And I think you would agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. Represent representation. Representation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Look, um, moving on, I wanted to ask you all a bit about COVID, and I know we're all a bit battered after all these years now, but um, um, obviously we're, we're all aware of the negative aspects of COVID um, on all aspects of life, but including the glam sector. But I'm wondering if, from um, your own experiences, if there's been any positive things to come out of the COVID experience from a, from a museum and gallery perspective that we might be able to continue on with into the future. Have you had any positive experiences over the past two years? I mean, obviously you've had <laughs> in terms of the museum. <laughs> hoping everyone's had positive experiences, but <laughs> that's why I'll ask you to go first with that one. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think COVID has accelerated out of necessity, the kind of pivot towards digital. I know that you started the podcast during COVID, right? And um, that's just a given thing that museums do now, um, online engagement. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I don't think I need to repeat like why that's important in terms of like regional accessibility and, you know, people who might never, who might never physically go to the museum, you know, can engage online in these ways. Um, but I'm also a bit old fashioned. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'm not, not sure about you, but I registered for many, many more online events than I actually go to. And when I actually turn up, it's, you know, in the corner of my screen and I'm doing something else and it's not immersive. It doesn't have that social aspect to it. So yeah, digital is great, but um, I'm old fashioned. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I think digital experiences are best when they're they're tailored to the medium on which they are. They're not just like you know website content which has been pulled through, um, and that aren't trying to be an analog for the physical experience. Like something that springs to mind is Matterport. It's like three D scanning of exhibition spaces. And it's, uh, to me, it's like a really cool tech demo, but it's not, I've never had like a very immersive experience in, uh, in that kind of format. You feel it's missing the soul. Yeah, you need to be there. Like, and then, you know, it's tiny on the screen and then you're kind of like clicking to get to the next thing. And then you click in to try to see the object next to the label and you can't really read the label. Um, Anyway, so I, I don't think that's a good user experience. Like physical museum gallery experiences we've tailored over many years. So <laughs> I, yeah, anyway, I love museums. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I have to agree that creativity that museums were bringing to um, have digital experiences was great. At the time I was a student not working in museums, but um, looking at all the online opportunities. But it is true that um, in person is, can't really beat it, but um, I think that that um, the creativity and looking for new ways to connect with audiences digitally and how that increased accessibility is great. Yeah, I mean, I would echo yeah, those comments around um, online engagement and accessibility. 
Um, but one of the, the benefits, the positives, I suppose, I'm thinking on a very practical level um, through COVID is, is the development of outdoor experiences um, and sort of, you know, being in that, um, that safe space and, and sort of those ideas around um, site activation, I think, and outdoor experiences and placemaking. Um, and so thinking at the moment at SLM um, and where I work at the Hyde Park Barracks and the programs that we're developing, um, so after dark programs every two months, really activate, activating that outdoor space and, um, and contrib contributing to that sort of nighttime economy of, um, of the city and sort of bringing it back to life. Um, one of the programs I'm working on at the moment is, is the Barracks Annual Art Commission. Um, so in a few weeks, we've got a, a, a big projection opening by Daniel Crooks. Um, so it'll be a massive screen in front of the barracks. Um, and I'm working on next year's one as well, which is with the artists Tony Albert and Angela Tiatia. And they'll be doing a, a big sort of projection looking at the forced migration and the histories of the barracks site um, through the metaphor of birds. And so it's really just thinking about how do we sort of activate that outdoor space and bring those experiences inside, look at ways the outside and inside works together um, in terms of interpretation and placemaking for audiences. Um, so I think that's, that's a positive that's come out of COVID, yeah. Um, so on a personal note, I loved working remotely during COVID. <laughs> loved it. And um, so I actually had a baby in February 2020, so just before COVID kicked off. And for other family reasons, we had to come back to Australia during that time. But actually meant that after four months of maternity leave, I could go back to work and do it in the time that suited me. So whenever my child was asleep, I was doing work and no one questioned it because everyone was in an awkward situation. So I, I really, really thought that was fabulous. And now I love the whole hybrid environment too, but not that we have that so much now at Chow Chats. But <laughs> um, also, so um, we had funding from the Global Challenges Research Fund to do work in Egypt during COVID in 2020. Um, and this is to work with a village in a place called Fayum. And this is where all the mummy portrait panels come from. If you're familiar, they're like lifelike portraits in the Roman period. And um, to try and meet one of the sustainability development goals of the UN, it was to help try and revive this craft tradition. So we were teaching them how to make or construct and decorate mummy portraits to revive tourism and their local economy. So we were supposed to go there in person to do this. Um, obviously that wasn't able to happen. So we had to think creatively, how could we um, make use of this funding rather than try and postpone the project? Um, so we worked with people on the ground in Egypt to bring internet to Fayum, which is, it's a rural village. Um, the village is called Tunis. And um, we had, we, we commissioned a filmmaker to then make some films for us on the process of making the portraits. Um, and then we delivered everything remotely online. Our um, contacts on the ground went there. The only thing that made it quite difficult was they didn't have uh, an overhead like this. So it was all being um, uh, streamed through a laptop <laughs> and there was about 50 people. Um, but we're still able to make it happen. And, you know, with, with the second part to the project actually going there, it, it's still been really worthwhile. Thank you, everyone. Now, look, if, uh, if uh, one of the powers of museums is providing multiple voices and empowering other people to engage and think, it shouldn't just be me asking all the questions. So I know we've got quite a few of our colleagues from the Chow Chak Ming Museum and a few colleagues from other institutions as well, and of course, staff members from the Museums and Heritage Studies Program, the University of Sydney here in the room. Would anyone like to ask a question from the floor? I'll, I'll run up with the microphone if anyone does, but... Feel free to put up your hands if you have any question for our panelists together or anyone individually. Thank you very much. Hey, so thanks everyone. I'm doing my master's in art curating here at UCID. And I was wondering, coming into the museum industry, I used to work at a museum in the States when I was doing my undergrad. And I found because Oregon, the state itself, isn't very diverse. I was wondering, do you see diversity in museums becoming more diverse? spaces or are they still white dominated areas what do you think about that do you really see action or is it more like tokenism in a way would anyone like to answer do you mean staff members or visitors to yes, the museum uh, okay well i think at the end of the day it's the best person for the job isn't it so it doesn't matter what color you are it's if you're the right fit for the role Um, I agree in some respects, but I think there's also the idea of lived experience um, is very important as well. 
And so whether, Tuan, when you're talking about um, developing that exhibition, yeah. um, the Pride exhibition or, or something about a diverse community, there's, there's the element of lived experience and trust that comes into that. And so when you're working with the community, um, when they see somebody that looks like them or talks like them or has the same lived experience as them, I think there's there's a different level of engagement and sharing. Um, so, so I guess I, I feel in, in two ways about, um, about that. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree with you, the importance of lived experience, but it's a complex um, question. <laughs> um, so in the Australian Museum, I come under the First Nations Division, where we're directed by Laura McBride, and our manager, Melissa Malu, is the first Pacific Islander woman in the role, and our team is of Pacifica descent. Um, and it does make a difference, I think, in forging the new community engagement. Um, we're all from our community, um, and, pe and people have been fostering that their entire lifetimes here in Sydney, um, and we bring our cultural knowledge as well to the role. And I do think that's really valuable for the museum but we benefit as well to learn from our uh, other staff members who have been working in museums and have a lot of many years of experience in research too. Um, I think it's an empirical question. I think that any one of us can cite examples um, where you know there was good engagement with community um, but I really want to see the numbers. So um, I've cited like the audience surveys that MG New South Wales did before. Although, I mean, if you look at what they were measuring, they didn't you know, factor in um, ethnicity or indigeneity. Um, I, yeah, if is the sector getting more diverse? I think um, you need to define the parameters of where we're actually talking about. And then, then you need to do the hard work of you know, getting the numbers um, on, on whether we're attracting diverse audiences. Um, and you can quite easily apply that lens to what's happening internally in the sector in terms of the graduates that we're producing. Um, so I would say no. <laughs> um, that, that's like my very broad reading. I think that um, you know, the discourse around diversity inclusion has, um, actually, I think it's a more local, but, but if I'm going to be generalizing, there hasn't significant shifts over the last couple of decades, maybe not. We've, we've been talking about this for a very long time. Um, yeah. It's the power to change. It's, uh, the next question I was going to ask was actually about <laughs> education, and I might park that for a moment and come back to it. But is part of the, the way we change associated with uh, a, a teaching level, um, he says, pointing to our colleagues from the, from the uh, faculty, but, uh, but uh, more broadly than that, also engaging with school level um, and getting people to engage with that conversation right at the very beginning of their involvement with museums, both professionally, but also as museum goers. Sorry, that's not a rhetorical question. Does, does anyone have any, any ideas in terms of how we how we start to to break the cycle and to to to, to get broader yeah. engagement and representation? Gosh, um, I'm I'm going to do the cop out thing and say that I think that the other panelists have much uh, <laughs> more to say in this regard. Um, but I will say, like an amazing, from like a personal perspective, an amazing learning experience that I had recently a couple of weeks ago I was in Melbourne and went to Acme the renovated Acme it's been closed for it was closed for a couple of years and then reopened last year and wow it's just um it's a questicon for screen culture it's like full of interactives you can see kids like having the time of their life and you can see big kids slash adults like um <laughs> playing with the interactives and having a ball um, yeah, it just, it just made me into a child um, and I loved it. Um, go see it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think the, the more that you can get students and schools into museums and sort of from a, a young age and exposing them to different cultures and sort of that object-based learning being the point of difference that museums can offer, the more they see about other cultures, other lived experiences, um, 
other perspectives, I think, is, is that's the potential, that's where you get them and sort of get them thinking about empathy and compassion and understanding and seeing the world from different perspectives. Um, and so, you know, that, that has a flow on effect, I guess, yeah. Would anyone else like to ask any other questions from the floor? Thank you. Hello, I don't look at, but I'm a member of the vision impaired community and I'm always fascinated with museums because I love history, I love arts and culture and I step into a museum and people talk about these fabulous labels next to pieces of work <laughs> and I can't jolly well read them. And I'm just really interested, is Australia culturally thinking about going towards an industry standard for cultural, to, to engage the community from any, any sort of diverse uh, background, being able to access not just being able to be in front of the work, but being able to, I know there are sometimes you can touch and play and things like that, but just really interested about how you get the information across. And some museums have digital um, guides you go through and it's wonderful on your phone. So I'm just wondering what Australia is, is, is there something going on nationally? Um, would anyone care to answer? I think um, I, I can preempt some of the conversation by saying that this is often funding based as well. So. The resources are not always available to all institutions. However, that's certainly not an excuse for state-based larger institutions, but uh, not meaning to point at anyone, I should have stressed as well, but um, Kim, I believe you were going to respond to it. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good question and, and it's something that's often left out and often they are kind of pilot programs and bespoke tours that are offered um, to particular groups that come through when they make those bookings. Um, but one thing I was thinking about, and, and this is a bit broader, but is is that idea of multi-sensory interpretation. And so taking it away from, from just the visual or the physical and that sort of thing, um, how can we incorporate more sort of multi-sensory experiences um, in our interpretation and, and that way sort of create that kind of emotional, that, that effective engagement. And um, one of the, the very interesting things that we did a few weeks ago at Hyde Park Barracks was... Um, we worked with a perfumer, uh, she calls herself a scent smith or a smell smith, um, and what she does was created perfumes um, for the evening, so taking visitors back to Hyde Park Barracks in 1819, and um, so we focused on the pleasant smells, which <laughs> 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 of which there were, there were much more limited sort of pleasant smells with the convict barracks and the, um, the immigration depot, but um, but the idea was sort of taking away from just the visual and, mm -hmm. and the physical of what you can see and sort of using that to kind of trigger memory and, and to think about that emotional connection. Um, so we, we shared smells of um, bread baking in the convict ovens, um, the peach trees that were grown and sort of made cider on the site, um, the floral perfume from a little bot bottle of perfume that was excavated underneath the barracks that was carried by a British immigrant woman. So... I think there are, there are other ways as well to, to bring in that sort of multi-sensory interpretation. Yeah. Um, so I don't think there's a national standard, but I know Visions Australia funded the powerhouse going back at least 10 or 15 years to do an exhibition specifically for um, vision impaired people. Um, but it does tend to be a case by case thing now when there's money available, when the designers are agreeable to doing things. Often there are issues around having, you know, the written label and then a braille label, like it, it, aesthetically it's not always pleasing. I mean, there are lots of different, you know, issues at hand. So that's why we do like to multi layer the exhibition like Kim just mentioned mm. and have tours, audio guides and so forth. But it really does depend on, on each budget for each exhibition. Now, I believe there was another question. Sorry, oh, you were there. I saw another hand. Well, which one was um, thank you so much for the microphone. So actually my background is not related to museum or uh, related education because I graduated from the Sydney Uni from um, May 2018 with a master's degree in professional accounting and finance. Um, but my current focus is very much related to 17 SDGs as well as education. You know, one of the SDGs is related to education equity. So I really want to know how museum as one of the education to differentiate its core value and essence from other educations, for example, international education, uh, music education, multimodal education, and et cetera. Maybe my question is a little bit broad, but I really want to know the answer. Thank you. Anyone like to respond? 
Could I get a clarification? Does SGD mean sex and gender oh, diverse? Okay. <laughs> It's like, how do I bring this back to what I know? <laughs> Sorry, got nothing. Well, I mean, it's interesting that that Ecom themselves this year have described, um, yeah, the the um, one of the themes, uh, as you as you read out earlier, the power of achieving sustainability, and I guess ultimately, how are we defining sustainability from a museum's perspective? But then, how do we also then achieve that? Is, is perhaps a, a slightly bigger a, a side question from what you're asking, but ultimately what is, what is the museum's roles and responsibility in terms of being sustainable and then presenting how we can do this better? I guess, uh, this, I guess, well, I, uh, is everyone interpreting like sustainability as environmental sustainability rather than, you know, financial sustainability? Um, I, I think this is one of the, um, I mean, um, along with accessibility uh, within museums, it's one of the pressing issues for our, uh, for museums, um, indigenous social justice, um, and um, the existential threat of climate change. I think, um, I think, yeah, museums have uh, you know a great role to play in disseminating scientific scientific knowledge, so we can sort of front up to this. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is of fundamental importance to the sustained biodiversity and life on this planet, like the, without, you know, the living museum that is our earth, there are no museums. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have to agree. Um, and it's all interconnected in working on our Pacifica Gallery climate change and the climate emergencies at the forefront because Pacific Island nations are seeing the effects right now and have been devastated by environmental disasters and phosphate mining that have displaced huge populations. So um, it's something that can't not be addressed, um, but it's also difficult. <laughs> Are museums a, an environment in which um, uh, traditional ways of sustainable farming, sustainable fishing, sustainable engagement with land could be presented so there's not just the Western tradition of science will solve this problem, but actually also examining the way that humans globally have engaged with this problem and have found a way of doing it without creating the problems that the modern capitalist system has, do you feel? Yeah, absolutely. Um... No, sorry. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So I think um, incorporating those different ways of knowing and knowledge systems is, a, is an important way. There's um, Pacific people are already combating the effects of climate change that they are seeing in their islands um, and have had um, have worked in harmony with nature in a way that was disrupted during colonization and the after effects of that and capitalism, as you mentioned. So um, I think, yeah, being able to bring that through in galleries and um, speaking about Pacific climate warriors and the work that they're doing and highlighting that is really important too. Um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting that one of those those themes for ICOM this year was was you know sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, and they've got that UN Ocean Decade, what's it called, Decade of Ocean Science or something going on as yeah. well. Um, sort of in tandem with that, and um, and sort of just before I left the Maritime Museum, and and because I because I don't work there, I can talk about this um, sort of from the outside. But it's it's that sort of partnership between the museum and and that decade of ocean science, and it was very much focused on education and the way that museums can bring that sort of specific um, object based knowledge to to the to the teaching of students and education around ocean science and but sort of around activism mm -hmm. as well and um and we're seeing that you know museums as being sort of agents of social change and is that just a cliche or i mean are they actually <laughs> resulting in, in any social change um but i think it's an interesting thing with with those goals and sort of activism coming together through the museum yeah um, I might just go back to the point of the whole SDGs and Sustainable Development Goals in case people aren't aware of it. Um, so back in 2015, the United Nations announced 17 Sustainable Development Goals and they're really big picture thinking like make poverty history and gender equality and you know clean water and sanitation for everyone and this goal is by 2030. And museums are supposed to play a really key part in this, but 
in my opinion, I don't think we're actually doing a particularly good job of it. Um, their treatise on it is very impressive and I think there's great scope for museums, but from what I've actually seen in the flesh is, is very little actually working towards those goals on the floor. Um, so I have done work on two projects that were funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, specifically on capacity building in Egypt to set up a peer-to-peer -peer training network so that they could be self-sustaining in terms of exhibition development and research and, and world-class research. Um, and also reviving traditional skills. But again, once that money goes, it stops. So how are we gonna meet these goals if we can't sustain it? And when I actually came here with all due respect, some of my colleagues had never even heard of it before. So if museums and there are like what 55,000 of them around the world are supposed to make any difference, we all need to be communicating the same language. So, you know, what we've got, what's the year now, 2022, but we've got eight more years to try and solve the world's problem. <laughs> <laughs> To uh, begin to wrap things up, I would just like um, to ask each of the panelists if, um, you know, and we've probably hit upon quite a few of these points in the general conversation already anyway, but in, in your personal opinion, what can museums do better in the future from both your experience as working professionally, but also as museum goers, what would you like to see in eight years time and a hundred years time uh, museums be doing that we're not currently doing or that we're not doing as well yet i'll ask you this <laughs> sorry <laughs> um well i i might return to the beginning and then like reading out the icon theme um that's what we should be should doing more of it's contained within the statement um although like i'm critical about museums and where they are like I do love museums and galleries um I think it's strategically useful to think about the power of museums in um these kind of like broad unqualified ways um so that we can bring about you know what the ICOM statement is actually saying um and so it's kind of like believing in fairies. You, you need to believe in them for them to exist. Um, <laughs> I think the future is, um, we can already see where we need to be in the future by looking you know, at the broader terrain of museum practice and emulating the best practice that is out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, I've only recently started working in museums in February, but. Um, so a lot of my experience comes from this one role um, and we are really focused in community engagement and then bringing in our cultural and traditional knowledge. So I would like to see that happen more with the way that we store and handle our objects and the correct protocols that make it culturally sensitive and museums being open to that um, and being open to implementing that and making that part of best practice is something I would like to see. Kim, any ideas? Um, Oh yeah, I've, I've got a few ideas, but I'll just rattle them off without any commitment to actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think certainly around community engagement and um, building that social inclusion, um, empowering people, all that sort of thing, you know, building belonging and identity, um, multi-sensory engagement, you know, emotional engagement, and I think really harnessing um, that, that sort of soft power of museums and, and their collections for cultural diplomacy as well, I think is, is an area to develop. Yeah, I'm going to second that. So for me, it's inclusivity. So I still think there are many audiences out there that we need to be focusing on. And the way that I see us doing that is us going out into the communities a lot more and trying to spread the word about what we do and have a face to the museum. And that's a way of starting those relationships and making people feel comfortable. Um, it's going to take time, but I think um, this is the way forward for now anyway. Thank you. Um, I would just add that I feel that the most important thing is you um, and uh, museum audiences more generally, again, building upon the points that you all made. But um, thank you very much for giving up your time this afternoon to come and mark International Museums Day with us. The best thing you can do is to go and enjoy museums, <laughs> go and visit all of the wonderful collections that uh, and institutions that our panelists work for. Um, we are spoiled in Sydney with choices. Um, it would be lovely to have resources for even more choices. So if any of you thinking of, you know, Vote well, we all have to vote on Saturday, but uh, um, you know, just think of the power that we have to change. 
Um, and museums are part of that change. And so, yeah, we, we need to engage more broadly with, with museums mm -hmm. as, a, as an entity, but also as individual institutions. Wrapping it all up, I'd like to thank our mm -hmm. colleagues in uh, museums and heritage studies, um, both for uh, supporting this panel and last year's panel as well, but also providing the wonderful panelists, not just in terms of uh, suggesting names, but also um, being a big part in all of your respective educations as well. So thank you. And a big thank you to the Chow Chak Wing Museum for letting us have the space to do this today. So I will ask everyone in the audience to please join me in thanking our panelists. A big thank you to Dr. Tuan Nguyen. A uh, big thank you to uh, Miriam Simmons. A big thank you to Kim, uh, Dr. Kim Dahl. And a big thank you to Dr. Melanie Pitkin this afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.